In this film, I would like you to meet some of the people who teach here in the mathematics department at Imperial College. I should be talking to them about their own mathematical careers, their interest in mathematics, and the courses they teach. We shall be talking to Dr. Herbert, who teaches applied mathematics, Mrs. Snell, a statistician, Dr. Moore, who specializes in numerical analysis, Pro Professor Wolfarth, a mathematical physicist, and lastly, Professor Roth, a pure mathematician whose main interest is number theory. First of all, I spoke to Dr. David Herbert and asked him about our first year courses in applied mathematics. Dr. David Herbert, you're one of our lecturers in applied mathematics. Can you tell us something about the content of our first year courses in applied mathematics? Yes, the first year applied course falls into three distinct parts. The first part deals with particle dynamics, quite a bit of which will be familiar from schoolwork. This covers topics like rotating frames, central force fields, uh, motion in resisting media, and variable mass problems. This leads on through systems of particles to deal with rigid body motion. And then this is in now in the second term, a completely new way of formulating the equations of motion is presented. This is a very powerful technique which enables really quite difficult problems involving motions of small amplitude oscillations to be dealt with. That really completes the first part of the course. The second part deals with computational mathematics, which I think Dan Moore is going to talk about later. The third part deals with electrostatics. This is a course which leads into the second year. In the first year, several new ideas and also new mathematical techniques are introduced, which are extended in the second year course. When you're lecturing, David, do you mind if students interrupt your lecturers with questions? No, not at all. I, I enjoy this very much. I think it's all too easy when lecturing to 50 to 100 students for a lecture to become very formal. And I much prefer lectures, my own lectures, to be as informal as possible. And one of the best ways of achieving this is if there is a contribution. Although I, one appreciates, of course, it's very difficult for most students to interrupt. They may not have the confidence, for instance. Um, but if they're not prepared to interrupt, then at the very least, at the end of a lecture, for example, if they're not um, altogether happy with particular points which have arisen, they should make sure that they approach the lecturer to have these points clarified. It's uh, an advantage to the lecturer as well as to the student to know, for the lecturer to know what points are causing difficulty. Um, apart from lectures, we have supervision classes. Can you tell us how you personally conduct supervision classes? Yes, most of the time I prefer to go around and see people individually. We have usually about eight students in each supervision group, and I spend most of the time going around dealing with individual problems, either problems, outstanding problems with lecture notes or any problems that they have with the particular uh, questions that they're dealing with. So most of the time it is spent in that way. Occasionally, of course, there are general points which arise either in the lectures which they've had in that week or particular points arising from the problem sheets that they've had. And I might spend five or ten minutes talking to them as a group. But that is the most uh, that you, I would usually talk to. Also, uh, another feature is I always um, I make a habit of collecting work in so that I see regularly how the students are managing to deal with the problems. I think this is really quite important. Each of our undergraduates has a personal tutor in the department. How do you see your role as a personal tutor? Well, I think a pers the role of a personal tutor is a very important one because with uh, a large department as we have and a large number of staff, a student, especially a new one, can very easily feel quite lost and have no point of contact within the department. So I think the personal tutor the, has the role of giving uh, each student uh, a person, a member of staff, who he knows or she knows quite well uh, to begin with and, uh, and hopefully very well eventually. So that if there are any problems which arise which um, a student might not feel able to go to the senior tutor to discuss, then there is always a personal tutor there. 
As far as seeing students are concerned, personal tutors see their students in the first year on a regular weekly basis. Uh, and those are really initially to deal with any mathematical problems which are outstanding, which haven't been covered in supervisions. So most of the time that one sees one student, uh, one's dealing with uh, mathematical problems, the rest of the time uh, one discusses any uh, personal problems which may arise uh, during the course of the year. Now I would like you to meet Dr. Dan Moore, who lectures in computational mathematics. Dan, can you tell us something about your early interest in mathematics? Well, I started being interested in mathematics in school as a tool to working in science. Um, it helps you solve real problems if you're trying to build telescopes or study rocket flight. Sort of the early things many young people with an interest in science get initially into because it's within the range of simple mathematics. You can design telescopes with simple algebra. You can chase rocket trajectories with uh, very simple geometry. And this got me interested in mathematics as a tool for exploring science. And when I went to university, I then had the opportunity to simultaneously pursue both science and mathematics. Where, where did you do your degree? I did my first degree at Princeton, where you have a four-year course of which only half of half the courses are taken in a particular subject, so that I was able to spread my interest both across astrophysics, physics, and mathematics, and do other interesting subjects like, well, Russian history music. Uh, and where did you go after you'd been to? Princeton? After I finished my degree at Princeton, I went and did my PhD at Cambridge, the Department of Applied Mathematics. Have you uh, been involved in pra practical applications of mathematics at all? Oh, from the beginning. Uh, when I first went to university, I learned how to use a computer in my first weeks there and was able to earn money as a programmer for the physics department, designing experiments in elementary particle physics. Mm -hmm. So that I've always been involved in the application of mathematics to solving either physical problems or problems coming out of the study of physics or astrophysics. Um, you're interested in numerical analysis and computing. Can you tell us something about these two subjects and how they enter our undergraduate course? Well, the computer is a tool for a mathematician. It enables him to solve problems that previously were beyond the reach because of the amount of work involved. We are teaching the use of the computers as a natural tool to a mathematician, rather like he uses calculus or algebra or a pencil and paper. And what we are trying to show is how you can use the computer to extend your powers as a mathematician. Um, how much computing do the undergraduates do in our course? At present, we teach them how to use the computer in the middle of their first year, and then after that point, give them one lecture a week in using the computer and a one-hour practical session every week. Uh, in the course of the second half of their first year, they do a series of three projects on different aspects, on mathematics at, for applied mathematics. Are there opportunities for undergraduates to do computing later on in the course if they want to? Yes. Um, the courses in the second and third year, some of them have a computational part that is part of the assessment is by project. These courses are largely voluntary. There's also a mathematics department computing club so that those with particular interest in, math in using the computer within mathematics can have access to the facilities and can pursue their own interests. Finally, can I ask you which qualities you think a good mathematician should have? Oh, probably the most important thing is a desire for perfection. And this is what characterizes mathematics from the physical sciences. Mathematics is a pursuit of perfection. Physical sciences are very much a compromise with what you can do. The essence of good mathematics is its perfection, its unwillingness to compromise, its insistence on finding the correct way of doing anything. Mrs. Joyce Snell is one of our lecturers in statistics. Joyce, can you tell me how you first became interested in mathematics? I suppose it was just that I liked maths at school and therefore decided to follow it and studied it at university. And then my interest in statistics developed from that because while I was still a student I took a VAC job working in industry and came for the first time upon the application of statistical methods into the field of engineering. Can you tell us something about the statistics courses here in the department? Yes. Uh, first, let me say that I think students coming to Imperial College are extremely lucky if they have an interest in statistics because we have 
I think it is 12 members of staff teaching a statistics and we have a large number of statistics courses which are on offer. This is very different from my own experience where I went to a college where geometry was the strong point and in fact I had very little opportunity and had to learn most of my statistics later on after I had graduated. But here at Imperial College we give a course on probability in the first year. It is a 26 hour course taken by all students. Then in the second year they have a course in the first half session on statistical theory that is taken by all students and in the second half session there is an optional course on further statistical theory. Then in the third year they are listed in the, the calendar the third year courses and students have probably had a look down this list there are nine courses listed there. What they are called is Statistics Theory 1, Theory 2, Applied Statistics, Stochastic Processes, Design of Experiments, Time Series, Stochastic Models in Operational Research, and Optimization. And I think that illustrates the wide range of statistics courses on option here. An individual student can opt to take entirely statistics courses in the third year if he wishes or he could take a mixture of some of those with other mathematics courses. Next I would like you to meet Professor Wolfarth who is a mathematical physicist. Professor Wolfarth, can you tell us about mathematical physics in this department? Now in this department we have a long tradition going back to the 1930s uh, when Sidney Chapman was professor here and uh, in uh, later uh, years of that uh, decade we had Harry Jones and Bill Penny. Bill Penny afterwards became rector of this college so I'm in a long line of tradition in mathematical physics. When did you yourself first become interested in mathematical physics? Uh, well when I was at school I had an excellent maths teacher and an excellent physics teacher and uh, I think the uh, physics aspect of my school teaching uh, moved me towards wanting to use mathematics to explain physical facts. And this went on when I went to university, the University of Leeds, where my uh, teacher was also that way inclined. So I've always been interested in uh, mathematics as a tool in understanding physical phenomena. Can you tell us something about your research? In my research is in the theory of the solid state. I'm interested in properties of uh, solid materials like metals and oxides and so on. In particular, their magnetic properties. I'm professor of theoretical magnetism here in this department, a rather unique title. And uh, I'm trying, to, as I say, I'm trying to understand uh, magnetic properties of metals and uh, non-metals like oxides. Do you frequently collaborate with other people in your field? Uh, yes, enormously, because I'm, uh, I'm having to rely on experimental facts to build my theories on. I'm cooperating with um, experimentalists in the main all over the world. What do you think makes a good mathematical physicist? Uh, uh, one who has physical insight into uh, what he's trying to explain. The other types of mathematical physicists use models uh, to uh, engage their mathematical ingenuity on and they are going to spend their time looking for experimental facts afterwards to explain their uh, mathematical results. I'm different. I have the physical insight to have materials first and then build up a mathematical model around it and I feel my way of uh, working is at least as valuable as, as theirs. Can you tell us what you did after you'd taken your degree? Uh, well, uh, which degree? After I took my PhD, I uh, continued with the work I'd started in Leeds under my teacher, Professor Stoner. And then at a fairly early age of 24, I managed to get a lectureship here and I carried on more or less in the same way. Although I was being very much influenced by the work going on here, uh, 
the department was then led by Professor Harry Jones, who's still with us, and I was influenced by his way of doing things. Professor Roth is a pure mathematician whose main interest is number theory. Professor Roth, can you tell us what number theory is? Uh, well, in the first instance, it's answering questions about the integers. That's the whole number, whole numbers. Although more sophisticated questions arise from this. A typical question in number theory would be, is it true that every positive integer is the sum, sum of four squares? And the answer is yes, it was answered already by Lagrange. A typical question would be, are there infinitely many primes? And again, the answer was yes, and was answered already by Euclid. A, a much more difficult question is, are there infinitely many prime twins differing by two, such as 11 and 13 and 29 and 31? And despite the efforts of mathematicians over the century, it still remains unsolved. When did you first become interested in mathematics? I think quite early on, at the age of about 11. In the first year of our course, the pure mathematics consists of algebra and analysis. Um, can you tell us something about these courses? Yes, uh, I think I'll discuss analysis particularly because I've applied it a great deal in my number theory and I'm more concerned with the teaching of it. And I think the first thing to mention is that analysis in the university is very different from analysis in school. That is, it's not just more advanced. It's not uh, a continuation of analysis at school. It's different in nature. And the reason for this is that in school, one is concerned with intuitive ideas illustrated by diagrams. And although these intuitive ideas are valuable and relevant, they're very imprecise and they can often lead to the wrong answer. Although one doesn't notice this at school because the examples one is given are appropriate to the methods one is taught. However, in university, one wants to be completely precise, which means that one has to start with a set of objects and a set of axioms and explain everything in terms of these axioms. And unfortunately, the axioms for the real numbers are complicated uh, and therefore it tends to be difficult. However, it is extremely interesting uh, once one gets to master it. Which qualities do you think a good mathematician should have? Well, obviously one needs some aptitude. You're not going to be able to do mathematics without aptitude any more than you can play the violin if you're tone deaf, but I don't think that that's what's meant. Uh, I think the most important quality of all is staying power. Uh, one will never solve a difficult problem if one gives up after unsuccessful attempts. And motivation and staying power are undoubtedly the most important thing. But this applies equally well to any other type of achievement. One can never achieve anything without staying power. Something that's more peculiar to mathematics is one must feel the challenge of a problem. That is, if, one's, if one sees a problem that one can't solve, it's got to bother one and keep one awake at night, simply because one is so frustrated about it, not because one wants to pass an exam or one wants to earn one's salary or one wants promotion, but simply because it niggles, the fact that you can't solve this problem.